Greetings, Bill Mobley for the uh, Brain Channel on UCTV and for the Department of Neurosciences. Um, this is a series on Alzheimer's disease. We're uh, pleased to have so many of our faculty engaged in work of this type and especially pleased to have with me today Paul Azen, who has really been a leader in Alzheimer's disease research in the United States and internationally for a number of years. Paul, thanks for being here. Thank you, Bill. Tell us a little bit about you, about the Alzheimer's disease cooperative study and about your perspective on where we stand in understanding Alzheimer's disease and treating it effectively. Sure. Um, I've been working, as you say, in this field for quite some time. Actually, I feel that my career has grown up with uh, the development of clinical trials methods for Alzheimer's disease. And the father of the field, Leon Thal, was here at UCSD. And he started an organization called the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, or ADCS. ADCS is a consortium of uh, centers around the United States dedicated to developing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. The National Institute on Aging uh, funded the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study back in 1991, and since then it has been leading the development of new methods, of optimal methods for developing treatments for Alzheimer's disease. It started around the very first Alzheimer's trial, a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor in the late 80s. Uh, the success of that trial led to funding of the ADCS and Leon's work in bringing experts together to improve our ability to develop drugs. What that means is develop optimal assessments of the disease. Of course, Alzheimer's disease is not like hypertension where you can measure blood pressure. You can see immediately the effect of a treatment. Alzheimer's disease is invisible in a sense. We need tools to measure the stage of disease and the progression of the disease, and the ADCS has been uh, key to the development of such measures, biomarkers of the disease that allow us to diagnose it accurately, watch the progression, and test the impact of drugs on the biology of Alzheimer's disease, and to actually conduct studies. So at the ADCS, we work hard to improve methods and we conduct large multicenter trials of novel therapeutic interventions for Alzheimer's disease. We can thank Leon then for his, uh, his vision. Absolutely. Changed the field, did it not? Uh, it started the field yes. and has continued to drive the field. Mm. And I think Leon's being here at UCSD, he came from Albert Einstein and mm. came here and became the chair of neurosciences and the director of the ADCS. His uh, work here um, put the center of Alzheimer's disease therapeutics here at UCSD. Yeah, and uh, as his uh, successor, you've done a fantastic job. What, what are the challenges that, that you face right now as center director? What do you see in the field that's challenging, and how do, how do you and your colleagues respond? Well, when, this, when the ADCS started and when the field began in the 1990s, there were a string of successes. The development of four cholinesterase inhibitors and then memantine. Memantine was approved in 2003. So there was a 10 or 15 year period in which things were working. The methods were allowing us to bring treatments for the first time to this disease. A great success. Stimulated a lot of optimism worldwide. And then from 2003 to, to now, there have been no additional treatments. So that's hugely frustrating. Uh, why, have we, why have we failed to move beyond those modestly effective but purely symptomatic dr uh, drugs? They help, but they don't change the course of disease. They just reduce the symptoms a bit. How do we move beyond that, that first stage of, of therapeutics into the development of treatments that will actually slow or halt or prevent the disease. Initially, we thought it wouldn't be too difficult. We would use the methods used to develop the existing drugs. We thought we had a good handle on the biology of the disease. We thought we knew what the right targets are. That is, the amyloid hypothesis is very strong. It's not the whole explanation for the disease, but it, there's a very powerful rationale behind the idea 
that targeting amyloid is going to change the course of the disease. Therapies were developed against amyloid and then tested in the same way that Aricept and Memantine were tested, and they failed. Mm. Something is wrong. Either the drugs are wrong, or the dose is wrong, or the way we're testing the drugs is wrong. And I guess one has to keep an open mind about all those possibilities at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. Until you're successful, until you've met your goal, which is control or elimination of this disease, you have to be skepti skeptical about everything. You have to be open to ideas. You have to accept the possibility that your theories are wrong. But at the same time, you have to make progress. You have to move forward. You have to decide what makes the most sense now. How can we improve the odds now? So this has been the big challenge. Uh, and I think we've made just enormous progress in the last few years. Uh, we've been trying to understand how we have failed when we thought we should be optimistic, and how can we improve our chances. And while we continue to work on better treatments, more effective and safer ways of reducing the inciting molecule, which we think is amyloid in the brain, uh, we also think that the drug development strategy, the trial methodology is key. And specifically, we think that we were bound to fail mm. because we were designing our trials incorrectly. Traditionally, Alzheimer's disease has been diagnosed with the onset of dementia. And dementia is just cognitive impairment severe enough to interfere with your daily functioning. That was the onset of a disease. That's how the diagnosis was made. We now think that that's much too late, mm. much too late if you are trying not for symptomatic therapy, but you are trying to develop disease-modifying therapy. You have to go to the stage of disease when things are beginning, and that is well before symptoms have developed. So the biggest change in the field has been the idea that the onset of traditional Alzheimer's disease is at least a decade too late for developing disease-modifying therapies. So and the idea there is that the disease begins at a time when you can't easily diagnose it and where the patients may not know that they have a problem. Patients may not know, their families may not know, mm. their physicians may not know. Mm -hmm. That's right. That the disease has been brewing for a decade before a diagnosis can be made. Mm. And we need to develop our drugs by studying the impact at the earliest possible stage, which means an asymptomatic stage. How do we do that? Well, we need new tools. And the good news, the reason why even after a decade of no new drugs, we're very optimistic that we're making good progress is because we have great new tools. And I just want to mention three tools. Please do, yes. Two of them are high-tech tools, imaging neuroimaging using PET scanning. The new methods allow us to visualize the primary lesions of Alzheimer's disease in a living person. So Bill, as you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease was always called probable Alzheimer's disease because you could never be sure until you examined the brain at autopsy whether the lesions of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles, are present because we couldn't tell until we examine the tissue. Now we can tell. We have two great molecular imaging tools, one that shows us amyloid in brain and one that shows us tangles in brain. The tangle method, the tau pet, is only about a year old. Mm. The amyloid pet has been developing over the past decade and became uh, readily usable in clinical drug development over the last few years. So just in the last few years, we can now be sure of the level of amyloid and the level of tau and tangles in the brain of a person, and we can assess those things serially. So we can look at the progression of the disease and assess the, uh, the effect of an intervention. Mm -hmm. so very I, powerful tools. It's fantastic, very exciting. Um, one might ask the question, is that early enough? Yeah. So uh, these tools push us that decade or more before 
the traditional onset of Alzheimer's dementia. They've made a big difference. We can now conduct trials, and as you know, we are now conducting trials in people who are clinically entirely normal based on the results of molecular imaging that shows us the lesions of Alzheimer's disease. And this makes the likelihood of success vastly greater so that I am optimistic about the current uh, round of clinical trials. We'll test all of the leading candidates for therapies at this very early stage. And we will assess the efficacy of those treatments not only with PET imaging, with tau and amyloid PET imaging, which we're using, but also by assessing brain function just using cognitive tests. Yeah. So we have developed sensitive cognitive tests that are quite accurate in showing the progression of the disease even a decade before onset. But one of the things we've learned is that even at the earliest stage that we are identifying people now, which is based on amyloid patents 10 years before diagnosis, they are already showing no symptoms but cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And that raises the question that you just raised. Maybe even that's too late. If there's already cognitive decline, silent, inapparent to the, to the people and their families, but present, that means that already the synaptic connections are failing. And maybe we need to go earlier still. As I said a few minutes ago, until we're successful, mm -hmm. we have to be skeptical about everything and open to I, other ideas. And one of those ideas is that we'd better understand what the very earliest change is. What does the transition from normal aging to the molecular, the clinically silent, but molecularly abnormal earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease, what does that transition look like? How can we identify people before there is any brain dysfunction, silent or symptomatic? You know, it's so exciting because <clears throat> what we bring to the study as scientists, as neurologists, as clinicians, is an insistence upon the very best tools, the very best biology, the very best clinical trial design, all of it focused on trying to help people who do have or will have Alzheimer's disease. And it's an evolutionary process. We're not going to have all the best things tomorrow. But as you say, these steps that we're making, however significant they are, are nevertheless incremental. But we hope they, we get it, we, they get us to the next level, to the point at which we can say, the amyloid hypothesis, guess what? We've got some evidence to support that. Or the tau hypothesis, guess what? We're closer to testing that and being successful and helping people. It's an exciting process. Reflect on your own sense of the emergence of this part of your career and, and how it's, what's it meant to you as a person? Well, it's, it's a privilege to be working in this field, to be working in an area that can have such an impact on world health. There, I think there's nothing like it. There's nothing more exciting than that. As you point out, our progress is incremental, and yet, as I've tried to convey, we're very excited about where we've come. Not to say that the answer is going to be at hand tomorrow, but we think it's in, in sight, in view. Mm. One of the things that is very rewarding about being in this field at this point in time is the extent to which the community of scientists worldwide has come together to share ideas and collaborate. The extent of collaboration in the area of Alzheimer's disease, and especially, at least to my perspective, in Alzheimer's disease drug development, is, a, is breathtaking. So, we work hand in hand with scientists worldwide, academic scientists, pharmaceutical industry scientists, regulators, philanthropists. We all work together hand in hand to talk through ideas, to optimize progress, and we share everything. And this is a new model, I think, for science. We, the, the norm now in Alzheimer's disease drug development is to share everything even before publication 
something very different from the traditional approach in science where it's the individual investigator. The PI is the one who gets credit and protects the data and doesn't share it, publishes it. That's all gone by the wayside in Alzheimer's disease therapeutic research. We are all working together, sharing everything, and that is the way to make the steadiest progress and get to the goal as quickly as possible. And being part of this shift, this re a real paradigm shift in science, I think, is, is just terrific. It's been great. It takes a whole world to solve the problems that Alzheimer's disease poses. And we thank you for your contributions, Paul. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and for It's On Our Mind. <laughs>